We may talk of man's essence, we are all cut from the same spiritual cloth, and man's personality, we are all unique individuals, but the essence of God is different from the essence of man. For one thing, all members of the Trinity share the same divine essence, and the idea of personality in the Trinity is different from that of human persons. To take but one example, the absolute unity of agreement and purpose of the Trinity throughout all eternity is not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively beyond human experience. The lesson here is that rationalistic speculation, always dangerous when expounding the Bible, is even more to be avoided in the case of the Trinity, a doctrine that was only fully revealed with the arrival of the New Testament. What God has chosen to reveal about this doctrine, He has revealed carefully and gradually. The subject of the Trinity in the Old Testament is covered in this teaching. But it may be said here that a large part of the reason for this guarded revelation of the doctrine, beyond our human limitations in comprehending it, may be the all too obvious fact that wrong ideas about the nature of the Trinity have historically posed such a dire threat to the entire basis of our Christian faith. Just a little leaven in the loaf, and Satan can make the Trinity to be an association of gods, and so no different from paganism, or one god with three hats, thus completely eliminating the importance and efficacy of Christ's incarnation and sacrifice. In his loving wisdom, God has told us what we most need to know without giving us either information that could be misinterpreted or less than accurate illustrations that might do more harm than good. Illustrating the Trinity As we have just stated, attempting to illustrate such a carefully protected doctrine as the Trinity has the potential of doing more harm than good. The fundamental problem with illustrations of the type is that they all necessarily contain potentially dangerous and untrue points of comparison, which, if too much stress be placed upon them, run the real risk of leading to heretical conclusions, a danger that far outweighs any good they may do in attempting to shed some light on the subject. The number one objection to such illustrations is that God is divine, and since nothing and no one else is, any illustration will needs be imperfect and inaccurate, a fact which may well explain why no such illustrations occur in the Bible, Isaiah 40.18. And there is more. Historically, Satan's attacks on the doctrine of the Trinity, a teaching crucial to the integrity of our Christian faith, have focused on the threefold sovereign personality of God and or His deity in three persons. But this reality of divine triune personality is precisely the point that all illustrations of the Trinity miss, of necessity, since there is nothing like the Trinity. An illustration from the early church, the Trinity Triangle. This oldest of the Trinity illustrations is also in many ways the best, because the non-doctrinal point of comparison, that is, the triangle, merely serves to organize visually the meaning imparted by the words all three members of the Trinity are God, one in essence. Yet they are distinct from each other, three in person. The illustration of the family of man like the Trinity, mankind has multiple members, all possessed of similar spiritual essences, but the Trinity share a unique, divine essence, and their triune unanimity of purpose is unlike anything in the realm of humanity. The illustration of the human mind. Like the Trinity, the mind can be said to be at once one thing, yet at the same time several things, intellect, emotion, conscience, etc., and can dialogue with itself, and even be at cross-purposes with itself. But the Trinity is composed of distinct, divine personalities, to which the inner workings of our psyches make a poor comparison. Illustrations from the world of nature. There are many things in the natural world that consist of distinct, multiple parts that at the same time constitute one complete whole. For example, distinguishable branches, roots and trunk are all part of one and the same tree, and eggs have three distinct parts, yolk, white and shell, without any of which three you would no longer have an egg. None of the illustrations of this sort really help to explain the unique personalities of the Trinity or their shared divine essence. Illustrations from the physical realm. This category of illustration contains some of the more interesting examples that have been used to explain the Trinity, though all suffer from the same objections that were lodged against the former category. Light is one yet distinct, 1 John 1.5. Radio is heard, visible light is seen, infrared is felt. 
The universe is one yet distinct. Time, space, matter. Time is one yet distinct. Past, present, future. Space is one yet distinct. Length, breadth, height. Matter is one yet distinct. Energy, matter, phenomena. The most that can be said for the best of these illustrations is that to the extent that they remind us of the awesome wisdom and power of God in creating these complex, wonderful things, often taken for granted, they may also help us to realize that the Maker is likely to be even more complex and wonderful, and so accept what we know to be true about the Trinity, one in essence, three in person, even if it seems too complex and wonderful to fully grasp. As we have said, however, care must be taken to see that none of these illustrations is taken too far, lest by attempting to understand beyond what is written, we be led instead to dangerous and extra-biblical rationalizations based on these loose analogies. For the Trinity is often a good litmus test for our Christian faith. To accept it, one must accept not only the existence of God, but the distinctiveness and divinity of Jesus Christ, the true touchstone principle that divides believers from unbelievers, 1 John 2, 22 and 23. By distorting our understanding of the Trinity, the devil ultimately seeks to destroy our faith in Jesus Christ. The real focal point and rationale for satanic attacks that seek to confuse the issue of one in essence, three in person. Roles of the Trinity in the plan of God. A more valuable approach than the use of non-biblical illustrations to understand the nature of the Trinity is the examination of the function of the Trinity as described in the Bible. The scriptures have much to say about how God works in human history, and specific to our topic, what roles the individual members of the Trinity play in that work, otherwise known as the plan of God. Introduction God has not been operating in human history on an ad hoc or reactive basis, but has been working everything together for good, Romans 8.28, since the moment of creation. The plan of God will be discussed as a topic in its own right in the part 2b of this series, Eschatology, but it will be helpful at this point to consider the unique roles played by the individual members of the Trinity in executing that plan in time, for by so doing we shall gain biblical insight into the true nature of the Trinity, the names of the Trinity. Much can be understood about the Trinity through a consideration of the names by which they are revealed. Collectively, the Trinity refer to themselves as God. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, translated in the New Testament by the common Greek word for God, Theos, is technically a plural of a word originally meaning Mighty One. Collectively, then, the Trinity share this appellation, pluralized to express additional majesty. Individually considered, however, members of the Trinity in the Old Testament are referred to most commonly by the Hebrew word Yahweh, translated in the New Testament by the common Greek word for Lord, Kyrios, a word that, as we have seen, calls special attention to the Lord's timeless and dynamic being. These two names, God and Lord, emphasize respectively the unity of the Trinity in its threefold persons. Elohim is plural, but refers to the Trinity collectively, and the joint divine essence of all three individual members. Yahweh is singular, but can be used to refer to any of the Trinity's members individually. With the fuller revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament, following the revelation and advent of Jesus Christ, the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit give us an even clearer understanding of the roles of the Trinity, and therefore, of the Trinity itself. The Father, the first person of the Trinity. Origin. The term for an idea of the fatherhood of God, a designation well known from the New Testament, is also found in the Old Testament from the Pentateuch onward. The word Father is first used for God in Deuteronomy 32, 6. Is he not your Father, the one who bought you? He is the one who made you and established you. Later in verse 18 of the same chapter, God is referred to as the Rock who fathered you. The concept of the fatherhood of God can also be seen at Exodus 4, 22, where Israel is referred to as God's firstborn son. Significance. The use of the name Father is clearly intended to be taken as an analogy from human experience. Like the Father who sired us, He is our Creator. Like a Father, He is our authority figure, our trainer, disciplinarian, and teacher. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And not to be underestimated, He is the one who cares for us and loves us deeply. 
who protects us, keeps us safe, and wants only what is truly best for us, regardless of what we see as best. Being human, our earthly fathers had strengths and weaknesses, and despite their best intentions had to act on the basis of imperfect information about what was best for us. But our Heavenly Father represents the perfect ideal of fatherhood. He acts toward us always in perfect love, and all He does for us is without question for our ultimate good, for whether He disciplines us or blesses us, He does so in perfect knowledge of who we are and of all that is in our hearts. Person The Father is often referred to as the first person of the Trinity, that is, the authoritative I person, because He speaks to us as I, directly manifesting His authoritative will as our God, Creator, and Ruler of the universe, for example, Exodus 3, 14 and 15. The Son, the second person of the Trinity. Origin, along with the holy angels, Job 38, 7. We believers are all sons of God, Romans 8, 14. This widespread franchise of sonship is based upon the paternal position of the Father relative to all His obedient creatures, but there is only one, the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Though Christ's incarnation was, in a veiled fashion, prophesied and foreshadowed by ritual and sacrifice, it remained in Old Testament times very much a mystery until the time of His actual first advent. Now it stands clearly revealed that the archetypical Son of God is our Lord Jesus Christ, and that the Old Testament parallels are types that look forward to this revelation. For example, Adam is the Son of God, Luke 3.38. Christ is the preeminent last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15.45. And compare the Son of Man, that is, Adam of Daniel 7.13 and 14, as well as New Testament usage. Israel is the servant of God, Isaiah 42.18 and following. Christ is the suffering servant who takes away the sins of the world, Isaiah 42.1. Israel is God's Son, Christ is the Son, Hosea 11.1 1, fulfilled at Matthew 2.15. Finally, though Solomon was David's direct descendant, Christ is his ultimate descendant, the Messiah, the Son of David who is also the Son of God, Psalm 2, 7-12. Significance. Building on the idea of fatherhood as discussed, sonship denotes the idea of a special and unbreakable relationship with the Father, one of dutiful subordination to the Father's will, but also one of special privilege, inheritance, and shared authority. A son, especially a king's son, is often more accessible than a father. The role of mediator between the king and his offending subjects can only be played by someone who is on a par with both the father king and creature subjects only a son, incarnate, can be sent on such a mission of reconciliation.